Okay, now we're going to talk about how the neuron actually fires. Um, as we mentioned and we saw in the model, if the membrane potential gets over that critical threshold theta, the neuron fires a spike. And as we saw, the spike resets the membrane potential back down to the resting level, and then it climbs back up and you get this repeating cycle. Um, that's how real neurons behave. But it turns out in our models, it's convenient to actually use uh, a approximation to that called a rate code approximation. Uh, rates have a lot of advantages from a sort of simplicity and computational perspective. Um, they're instantaneous. You can kind of read out directly a real numbered value um, and send that to other neurons and it kind of immediately reflects something that otherwise would have to be integrated and computed over time. Um, they're also less kind of noisy because uh, a spike is kind of spiking and gone and spiking and gone. Uh, again, it's kind of something that's a, a very time varying signal, whereas a rate just kind of cr climbs up and stays steady like that. Um, and so it allows us to use smaller models that run faster. Um, we have fewer neurons, uh, but we're also losing out on some critical information processing capabilities that you do get with spikes. And so it's really important to understand that we are using this approximation most of the time. We do have versions of the model that, that run on spikes. And some people really have invested a lot of time in trying to get the spiking models to work. Um, often enough, I think they end up making them essentially work like the rate code models. And the spikes are not necessarily doing as much work as they might be doing in the real brain. Um, but uh, our goal overall is to uh, understand um, how the spike codes relate to the rate codes, and we want to have models that work at both levels. Um, but for this course, mostly we're going to be using the rate code version. Uh, and so here we want to understand what is a good equation that we can use that would do a good job of approximating what the spikes are doing, um, but giving a single number as an approximation. And so it turns out this function, the noisy x over x plus 1 uh, equation, does a really good job of matching actual spike rates that we see in our models. Uh, we can run our spiking model. We can run our rate code model with the same inputs. And we can kind of just compare those and see that they match up pretty well. So the x over x plus 1 function is something that looks like this. The, the, the raw equation is very simple. It's literally some kind of number x over that same number x plus 1. I'll tell you what that x is in a second. Um, it's actually the difference between the uh, current excitatory conductance minus this kind of threshold level of an excitatory conductance. Um, and that difference, basically, when it's below 0, we just set it to 0. Once it, once it gets above 0, um, it climbs up. And you have this steep rising part and then a saturation. And if you kind of imagine as you have a x over x plus 1, um, that, that 1 uh, um, that it gets smaller and smaller relative to x as x gets larger. And so it just becomes essentially, essentially x over x, which is really just 1. Uh, that what we call saturating property of the neuron um, is important because neurons can't fire above a certain maximum firing rate. As I mentioned, it's typically about 100 times a second. Um, and uh, it's very hard for neurons to kind of drive their firing much beyond that. Um, there's a um, uh, refractory period in the neurons. They can't refire again after they've fired within uh, that quickly. Um, and as you can see in our, in our model, they have to build up that kind of uh, membrane potential excitation to get over a threshold again. That takes them a, min a minimum amount, amount of time as well. So those factors lead to this kind of saturation property of the curve. Um, there's a threshold. It doesn't fire until it gets above that point. That's accommodated with this equation. And then the last thing we do to smooth out this kind of rough, uh, very sharp transition point right at the threshold is we add some noise to the, to the overall system. And uh, again, because we want to keep the system fairly predictable and reliable, we're adding the noise uh, kind of baking it into the equation instead of adding it, kind of literally adding noise trial by trial, second by second. Um, we, we sort of calculate what the average effect of the noise would be. And that's what's shown here in this red line is essentially convolving 
mathematically this equation with a Gaussian noise kernel. Uh, that's what we mean by kind of baking in the noise. It produces a very nice kind of sigmoidal shape. It's a little bit asymmetric. Um, it's not a pure kind of symmetric sigmoid that, that some people use in uh, artificial neural network models. Um, it's similar to the, the uh, popular kind of uh, rectified linear uh, equation that people use, but it does have a saturating characteristic, which is true of the brain, which is not used, not present in the ReLU or rectified linear equation. Instead of writing x over x plus 1, you can write 1 over 1 plus 1 over x. So that's a much more complicated sounding thing, um, but that's uh, what we express it as here. Um, and uh, it allows us to only write x once, which is the reason we use it, because we don't want to write this kind of expression here twice. Uh, there's a gain term gamma that multiplies this difference between the current uh, excitatory current minus the threshold. Um, it's a little bit interesting. We actually did the wrong thing originally with our model for many years and tried to uh, express the rate of firing in terms of the membrane potential because that's what literally is driving the spiking is the membrane potential. But it turns out that's not a good way of capturing what, what brains do. And so it, uh, the, the firing rate is driven directly from the excitatory current, but relative to this GE theta term, which is the threshold, and that's not a fixed number. That is a dynamically changing number that depends on the amount of inhibition and leak you're getting. Um, and that's where those factors enter into the equation. And so basically this is, is essentially how much competition those guys are having pulling, again, tugging of war, t the tug of war analogy, pulling the system back down. That all shows up in this equation in the context of this threshold term. Um, we also have to include some kind of time dynamics. Um, this is just a literal kind of subtraction difference. It doesn't evolve over time in the way that the membrane potential evolves over time with this kind of time constant dt. So we have to reintroduce that time constant in order to match the kind of temporal dynamic properties of spiking neurons. So it's a little bit more complicated, but these equations, again, you don't need to know anything really about the details of these equations. Okay, so now let's look at that rate code approximation in our model. This is what we were looking at before. Uh, we have uh, the discrete spiking, the membrane potential going up and being reset. Now what we're going to do is flip this bit here and say turn off spiking. Pay attention to this uh, green line. This is the uh, activation value that was computed directly from the intervals between the spikes. Uh, you can see that we actually only get a green value after the second spike because then it knows the interval between the two. And that's, that's how this is computed. Um, now we're going to use instead our noisy x over x plus 1 function. And when I run this, I better hit the init button, um, it's going to directly compute that activation. And if you kind of could see that, I uh, have to pay attention carefully. The green line essentially traced out the same trajectory that it traced out before, but now this green line is being computed directly from the excitatory uh, input, the GE, that we're getting relative to the uh, GE theta, this kind of dynamic threshold that's computed from the, the leak or inhibition. So if I Again, go ahead and change this. Uh, I can see the same behavior that when I reduce the amount of excitation into the cell, um, the response is weaker. Uh, it also exhibits a threshold. So when I have a below threshold amount of firing, um, I get uh, a, still a membrane potential, um, which is still being plotted even though it's not being used directly in the calculation. Um, but I no longer get a green kind of firing value at this point. Green is down here kind of buried in the red. Uh, if I go back above threshold, you can see this green um, uh, excitation burst. And you can see again that we are still computing the adaptation, uh, this uh, sodium generated uh, potassium currents. Uh, we can turn that off and um, see just a sort of steady state response that we would get without that. Now we can compare directly the spike versus rate 
by running this spike versus rate plot. And here you can see on the x-axis, we're plotting the uh, different levels of excitation, GE, that we're putting into the cell. And on that y-axis, um, both the rate of spiking empirically as measured by you know how the interval between those spikes, um, and then uh, also our noisy x over x plus one equation. And they're different in detail, but they both exhibit this kind of saturation, this sharp rise, um, and, uh, and it's a, a reasonable overall fit. The red is the rate code and the black is the empirically computed spiking rate. So on a grand scheme of things, this is a very reasonable approximation to um, the actual empirical uh, rate of spiking.